Hi, I'm Mira Kumar. We will be presenting our demo project, Intracranial Hemorrhage Detection and CT Scans, Using Deep Learning, written with Thomas Levitsky, Raymond Hong, and Professor Wu. An intro to our problem. An intracranial hemorrhage is when a blood vessel ruptures within the skull and leaks. ICHs can affect various patients. Some causes include trauma, stroke, high blood pressure, and drug use. Different types of ICH can be identified by their distinct shape, location, and size. Their attenuation is affected by the region within the, the skull that they occur in. For example, subdural and epidural occur between different layers between the skull and the brain tissue called the dura and arachnoid, which is why they're commonly found very close to the skull in CT scans but have different shapes. The others appear within the brain tissue or within the cerebral spinal fluid. Early diagnosis is key for patient mortality. Diagnosis time includes taking a CT scan and waiting for the radiologist's assessment of the scan. With computer vision, the time for diagnosis can foreseeably be reduced. A CNN capable of complex image classification could re can reduce a radiologist's workload by speeding up diagnosis time. Convolutional neural networks have already proven to be successful in recognizing such spatial features in visible spectrum images. We believe that a machine learning system could be used to accelerate the diagnosis of these time-sensitive conditions. We set out to see whether architectures traditionally designed for visible spectrum images would also perform well in classifying CT scans, which are X-ray spectrum. We build a convolutional neural network model based on a ResNet for hemorrhage classification. Our model achieved an accuracy of 93.3% in making the correct multi-class prediction and an average per class recall score of 76%. We show that it is possible to achieve an average recall of 86% while maintaining 70% precision via tuning the prediction threshold. Lastly, we show the real-world applicability by deploying the model in a form of web application. The source code for training, evaluation, and web application are available in references. Our data set is provided by the Radiological Society of North America with patient files from four different hospitals and over 750,000 um, CT scans in the format of DCM files, which has a cross-sectional image of the brain, um, along with metadata, including patient information and spe specifications of the CT scan itself. There are six patient labels, one that's marked any, which says there is or isn't a hemorrhage in the CT scan, and the five other labels specify the type of hemorrhage. Looking at this table, we can see that these classes are not mutually exclusive you can have more than one type of hemorrhage in one scan, which led us to have some problems with the data imbalance. We had to be mindful of it. 85.7% of the data was negative, negative samples, so there were no hemorrhage in the scan. And 10% had one diagnosis, and the remainder had more than one diagnosis. Also. There are certain hemorrhages that are more common than others, as shown in this pie chart. Subdural was the most common type of ICH, and epidural the least common. Going into our methodology, pre-processing is an important step. As seen on the left, the raw CT scan image um, is almost featureless. It's very hard to tell what the brain tissue and blood structures in the brain look like. So we used windowing, which is a common um, method in CT image analysis, which manipulates the CT image grayscale 
in order to change the appearance and highlight particular structures. The brightness of the image is adjusted via the window level, and the contrast is adjusted via the window width. By reducing the window width, we reduce the transition of light of, to dark structures, and it highlights the attenuations between soft tissue that may be initially obscured, as seen in the brain matter image and the subdural blood images. It's much, there's a much clearer image of the brain within it, within the skull. Using standard width and level for bone, blood, and brain tissue, we were able to create three different layers with clearer images. We, are, we then input these images as RGB within the RGB channels and then let that run through our model as talked about in the next slides. Our deep learning model consists of a convolutional base originating from ResNet50, which acts as a feature extractor, and a fully connected classifier on top of it. The three input channels, which in case of a visible spectrum image would be carrying color information, instead contain the input CT scan with different windowing supplied. As a loss function, we use categorical cross-entropy loss, to which we add class weights in order to compensate for the high class imbalance. We use Adam Optimizer, with learning rate visible on the screen, and determined via hyperparameter optimization. We use batch size of 16 and train for 10 epochs, which translates to roughly 48 hours on an NVIDIA P100 GPU. We evaluate our model on the randomly sampled, never seen test split of approximately 75,000 examples. We consider a prediction to be correct only if predictions for all six classes are correct. In the task defined in such a way, we achieve accuracy of 93.3%. However, as you might remember from an earlier slide, the dataset is imbalanced, so accuracy might be a flawed measure of success. This is why we keep track of precision and recall as additional metrics for our model. We consider recall score to be the most important measure of performance, as it corresponds to the number of sick patients that receive a correct diagnosis. Initially, we achieve an average recall of 76%, with the highest scoring class, intraventricular hemorrhage, achieving a recall of 86%, and the lowest scoring class, 68%. The class that performed the poorest in terms of recall was the one that had the fewest training examples, which was the expected result. The false negative results are particularly undesirable, as such a diagnosis can be dangerous for the patient. We want to avoid false negatives at all costs. This is why we performed precision recall analysis and you can see the PR curve on your screen. In the paper, we showed how we can further tune the predictive ability of our model by adjusting the threshold at which the final binary precision predictions are made. This way, we can allow for a certain limited loss of precision and yield higher recall, avoiding as many false negative diagnoses as possible. For example, by allowing a lower precision of 70%, we can achieve a, an average recall score of 86%, which is 10 percentage point higher than our initial result. As the last measure of performance, we carry out receiver operating characteristic analysis. The resulting curve is presented on the slide and the area under curve is 0 0.985. One more issue regarding the performance of the model we wanted to mention is the way we predict the label any. The information we carry with this label is somewhat redundant 
because we can calculate the label any simply as a logical OR operation on the five remaining labels. So the question arises, is it better to use that known underlying pattern or have the pattern be learned by the neural network? We tested both approaches and the learned approach yielded a better recall score, higher by 2.4 percentage points. And the explicit approach yielded precision score higher by 1.4 precision percentage points. Both approaches scored very closely in terms of accuracy. And because we care more about the recall score, we conclude that incorporating the predicted label is the better approach. This was a little surprising because, again, we know the exact math formula for the class any. Our model can run at low latencies even without expensive hardware. Even on the laptop without GPU acceleration I'm making the presentation on right now, the inference has a very acceptable latency of around 366 milliseconds. By running on low-end devices, we can deploy the application either on low-cost devices or even existing devices in medical facilities. This way, we can run the service on-site and we can avoid the need for moving the sensitive medical data back and forth to an external server. This is our live demo. We wrote a simple Flask app, which allows you to open this program in a web browser. The user can upload a DCM file to quickly analyze. The full graph forward pass takes about 366 milliseconds on a laptop computer. Here we can see the results for this image. Um, first off, the raw scan is pulled up along with some of the metadata, which can be important for a doctor looking at the scan. Here's the windowing. Um, the data here is what was inserted into our model, but it can be altered to suit um, the needs of a radiologist who's trying to analyze the scans. For this image, we get a diagnosis of epidural and subarachnoid hemorrhage. We can run this again on a different image. This time, since this program can be easily deployed on a mid-range computer, it would be easy to implement at a medical facility. And since it's run locally, you would have it would mitigate issues with uploading images to the cloud and um, the security problems that can come with it. For this image, it seems like a healthy brain, and this patient does not have any kind of hemorrhage from their scan. Thank you.